<laughs> so I'm Lila Rose. Um, I'm working with two fabulous collaborators today. Why don't you guys come up here with me? I'd love to introduce you. This is Annie Torsulieri. Hi. Annie is an assistant professor of theater here, and she's also a very accomplished actress. And then this is Jarrett Burns. He's a postdoc at NCES, which is the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which is a tongue twister in its own right, downtown. Um, and we're really excited to be here today. Now I'm going to ask you guys something kind of revolutionary. I want everybody to stand up, and we're going to make a circle and go around and introduce ourselves. Fabulous. So it's not revolutionary, is what you're telling us? Why don't you guys come on over this way? <laughs> ah, you invented it. Good. <laughs> all right. So just so we get a sense of who's in the room, and also so we can all get our voices out into the room. Let's go around, and why doesn't everybody say their name, where they're here from, if you're visiting, what your current talk is about that you'd like to work on today, what the principals will be teaching, and just for kicks, your favorite dessert. And if you don't have a favorite dessert, I've learned to be very precise with the physicists, um, a favorite dessert. So I'll begin. I'm Lila Rose. I'm here from Santa Barbara, because I live here. Um, my talk is about how to give a great talk. And my favorite dessert is rice pudding. Mm. Let's go to you. I'm Steve Leon. I'm from New City Santa Cruz, which is the I'm going to be one of the programs here for about two weeks, my last week. And I don't have a particular talk to work on, but I'm interested to learn about the principles of that particular talk. And my favorite dessert is apple crumble. Ooh, nice. Very healthy, very good. <laughs> but uh, and I thought I'd pick up some pointers. Uh, my favorite dessert is dark chocolate and mm. <laughs> Come join us.
Jared Burns. I'm a postdoc downtown at MP, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Research, which is not full. Uh, my talk that I've been working on lately is on the causes and consequences of complexity and ecological networks. And uh, my favorite dessert is going to have a softer. Mm. You get to light it on fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my name is Claudia De Grandi. I'm a, a, a graduate student, now also currently a graduate fellow here. Uh, my talk is about probing quantum systems through adiabatic perturbation, and I, I'm addicted to walnuts. Hmm. My name is Annie Torsilieri, and I'm in the theater department, an assistant professor, and I'm going to be here uh, being a part of this team working with you guys. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm really from New York City. I've been here for one year. And uh, my favorite dessert, probably traditional birthday cake with vanilla ice cream. And we had somebody sneak in. If you give us your name, where you're from, a current talk, and your favorite dessert. Nice. We've got a chocolate crowd in here. So um, the next thing we're going to do, and this is for everybody, so stay on your feet, it's a little bit of a warm-up. And a warm-up is something you do in theater as an actor before you go on stage. It's something you do as an athlete before you go perform. Yeah, perform, I guess athletes don't, do athletes perform before you go compete? <laughs> and um, it's something you do as a musician. It's kind of to get your instrument ready. 
Now I know you guys are used to thinking of instruments as things you use in the lab, but a way we talk as actors is that actually our bodies and our voices are part of our instrument. Today we're going to teach you how to use your instrument really well so that when people are listening to you talk about your findings, they're really engaged as a, like, with it as a performance as well as, as a fabulous piece of science. So I'm going to put the mic down and hopefully not get in trouble again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I want you to shake out both feet and just kind of get the blood circulating all around. Take out your arms, take out your face a little bit. And now we're going to do one of my absolute favorite things called bare face. So I'm going to say one, two, three, go. And everybody's going to make their face as big as they can. One, two, three, go. And now we're going to do chipmunk, which is the opposite. One, two, three, go. So bare. Bear, chipmunk. Now I want you to add a bear body. So big voice, big body. Go bear, big. Oh. Chipmunk, little. Do you want voice? You said okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. You're good. Bear, big. And really go for it. You're all very brilliant. I didn't even see this. Chipmunk, little. Now you're gonna add voice. So big bear voice, big bear body, big bear face. Go. Bear. Oh. That's really Anybody follow that at all? Hard to, right? Just a little indication of a starting point that we want to move in the other direction from. So once again, I'm talking like this. It's really hard to follow what I'm saying. I'm really not feeling very confident. So we're going to do some exercises about engaging our body, engaging our voices, and the primary thing, our imaginations. So I'm going to call this section, Fake It Till You Make It, OK? So some of this is sort of silly. Um, I teach acting over in the theater department. And what I like to do immediately, which you've already done, so we don't need to worry about it too much, is I like us to all just make fools of ourselves, get that out of the way. We know that you know, we're being a little silly today. It's maybe outside your comfort zone. That's OK. Nobody's going to tell tales. It's very, very secret what we're doing in here. 
Um, I want to start by, uh, maybe you can find your own space in the room. You don't necessarily need to be in a circle. You can just spread out so you feel a little comfortable. Um, yeah, great. It doesn't have to be in a line. Just enough, enough room that you can wiggle around a little. And I'd like you to imagine, again, starting from the one extreme of perhaps not a very powerful body. Let's imagine that you're a very slender, slender, uh, just the, the beginning of a tree that's growing that barely has any bulk to its trunk. And you are going to be some, you pick your tree, a uh, very th slender poplar or willow, and that there's a big storm. And the storm can just sort of push you all over the place. You can feel how your body is not very powerful. You're not particularly grounded. You're not particularly um, <clears throat> like the opposite of the bear that we were doing a minute ago, right? So now that's, that's starting at one. Now let's go to about three. Let's pretend you're uh, a bit of a stronger tree. I would say, I would suggest your, your feet are about the, the width of your shoulders. You can not lock your knees. Your knees can be flexible. And you can imagine that you are uh, perhaps a young oak tree or a maple tree, something with a little bit of bulk to it. And that same wind is going to come, and it's really barely going to move you at all. So let's just try that for a second. You can feel your roots down into the ground. Now let's pretend, which is actually on the corner of my parents' house, about a 150-year-old oak tree. Get those feet there. Boom, this tree is solid. A few years ago, a car hit this tree. The car was totaled. OK, so if a car hit you, that car would be toast. Feel your roots. Feel that your power comes out of the ground all the way up your body. Now let's imagine that wind. Nothing. Wind cannot shake you, right? Now, if the oak tree would like to move, it certainly can. It's the oak tree. Nobody's going to fuck with the oak tree. I have a very bad mouth, but we need to just embrace that today, OK? Because I think it's important. So you're the oak tree. You can move. You can see. You can walk. Everybody try it. Take a walk. You're the oak tree walking around. Watch out, world. I'm an oak tree. Don't mess with me. What? Yeah, <laughs> two oak trees collide? Well, we'll see. So you can just feel your power. Now, let's just go back to our spindly little wussy tree. And let's just take a walk as that spindly little wussy tree. Nothing. Uh, just exaggerate it. No power. You're barely, you're maybe on your toes a little bit. And when I say go, we're going to do oak tree. Ready? You're an oak tree. Feel the difference. You're alive. You're powerful. You can look around. Now, again, what I said is fake it till you make it. Are we oak trees? Of course not. Are we even feeling like oak trees when we're in that vulnerable position of giving a talk? Probably not. But you're smart people, right? This is a little bit mind over matter. OK? Now, let's just take it one step further. If you're really feeling like, oh, man, i got to give this talk, and oh, I just don't feel like an oak tree. I don't know what she was saying. That is craziness. Let's see what happens if you can pick an, uh, an object of your choice in nature. I'm going to give you some choices here. A big iceberg, the top of a mountain, one of those huge glacial boulders in Central Park. Imagine yourself the object of your choice. If you want to stick with the oak tree, maybe you want to even be a sequoia. Put that on. Try that on like it's a glove. Try that on and take a walk as that thing. You can still be alive. You can still be walking. Challenge yourself to find that strength within that. And relax. OK. Now, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is incorporating your voice and finding your power, using your body, using your imagination to know that 
I'm kind of talking like this, and I'm just sort of telling you what I have to say, even if it's sort of, sort of embarrassed about what I have to say. You know, nobody gets it. Nobody's interested. People are going to kind of feel uncomfortable. You don't want people feeling uncomfortable because that takes them out of listening to your, you know, wonderful scientific discoveries, and that puts them in the frame of mind of, oh, this guy, what are this girl, what are they doing? Right? You want to be confident, you want to be engaging, and you want to be arresting so that they can hear the content that you have to share. So let's do a silly little exercise. Find enough space around you that you can um, swing your arm like this without hitting anybody. Okay? I don't know if any of you have either done, uh, played softball in your life, or perhaps, if you can imagine, underhand baseball, lawn bowling. So now I'm going to pretend I have a softball in my hand, and I'm going to count to three. And each time I count, I'm going to launch that softball to someone in the room. Now, if you're lefty, I would suggest switching your stance. So whichever arm you're comfortable with throwing, put your other leg in front. You've got a little bit of a lunge going. Again, feel your power. Now, just watch me for a moment. One, two, three. OK? Can you guys try that? Don't worry about volume. Just take a couple swings to start without any numbers. And now, notice how my arm is really connecting to my whole body and the floor. And give it a try all together. One, two, three. Great. Now, just for argument's sake, shake out your body for a second. Go from the really weak place where you're not so connected to your body. And let's see the difference. I'll demonstrate. One, two, three. Now, try it again with the arm. And one, two, Three, and you want to make sure that the person you're getting it to is actually going to get it. Now, if I'm throwing a ball and my energy is like this, beep, it's going to land right there. So when I'm giving a talk, I don't want my energy to land here like I'm talking and I'm just, the energy is only going as far as here. I want my energy to reach to you. I want my energy to reach to you. I want it to reach to you. This can also be useful so that you can adjust depending on the size of your room. And if you're at a cocktail party or you're holding court at a soiree, perhaps, um, you can you know, start to play with the dynamic of not just volume, but actually your energy. How far is your energy going? So Stanislavski, the great uh, Russian um, theater master, talked about uh, an exercise with circles of energy. And sometimes he started imagining the circle of your energy just was, he didn't use the word hula hoop, but I will. It was as wide as a hula hoop around your body, and that might be something like this. Then I can imagine the circle shooting out for me a little bit further, and that might be like this. And then if I want the circle to reach you, that might be like this. And then if I want the circle to reach the back of the room, that might be like this. So let's take our three tosses, and let's toss one to here about two feet in front of you, toss one about 10 feet in front of you, and toss one about 20 feet in front of you. So I'll demonstrate for you. I'm going to just take a couple of practice swings. One, two, three. You can see the difference? So let's try it, OK? Take a couple practice swings, and we'll do it together. And one. Two, three. Great. Now, just for fun, on your own time, it doesn't have to be in unison, let's count to 10, throwing 10 different balls, and experiment with different people in the room. So I might send someone a, a ball to you who are close, to you who are far. I might try and reach the ocean with one of them, which is out that door, or up to the clock. So in your own time, OK, so just take a couple practice swings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, we have a creative person over here. I like it. Very good. OK, now just for fun, let's imagine that the talk you're creating 
has a spine to it. Now, uh, if you were, you know, teaching a literature class or you're teaching a, uh, a writing class, you would talk about topic sentences, your thesis, and all of that. Just as an exercise, and I know this is almost impossible, but just go with me here for a minute. Encapsulate what you're trying to say to about three or four words. For example, I might, for my talk, I might say, fake it till you make it. Okay? So I'm challenging you just to come up with something. It can be si silly, it can be wrong, but come up with three or four words that kind of speak to the heart of what you're trying to say. Global warming is bad. <laughs> Global warming is awesome. Everybody got something? So this time, instead of throwing the ball, I'm going to ask you to point as far as you're sending it. And we're going to say each phrase, and we're going to do them all at once so you don't feel too silly. And we're going to say that, do the same thing. I'm going to send a phrase to you. I'm going to send a phrase to you. I'm going to send a phrase to you. So I might say, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. It's ridiculous, right? We're all silly. That's okay. That's the point of this, to be silly. We actors do a lot of silly things. So let's try it. Take your phrase and send it to three different people in your own time. Just giving a little point so that you're reminding yourself if you're sending it to someone close or further. Fake it till you make it. 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 Okay, now one last thing. Let's go back to being the oak tree, the boulder, and let's add that in. So find a physical imagery that can, you know, stimulate your imagination, give you a little power. Not lock, not... Locked, alive. Alive is the oak tree, alive is the boulder, and the same thing. Let's send it to three people. So first, imagine your strength, your power. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Everybody. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. All right. All right, let me look at my little cheat sheet over here. Do you guys feel silly yet? Yeah? So, so? Should we do the next? Um, yeah. <clears throat> Great. So the, the next, we're going to take what Annie's just been uh, teaching us, looking at how you direct your sentences, how you direct what you're saying to different places. And we're going to use the sentences that we've brought here today. Um, and I'm going to talk about something that is probably fairly common. If you didn't bring a sentence. If you didn't bring a sentence, that's fine. A sentence, a phrase, think about a talk you've given recently. Think about a sentence that you use to describe yourself. Really, anything will work here. But what I want to talk about is when you're, you're giving a talk, and you're talking, and you make a really big point. Um, and what you're going to do when you make that big point is you're really going to try and impress the audience. Um, <laughs> because you want them to know exactly what you're talking about. Because that's really, really important. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm dropping the ends of my sentences. Uh, where we place the emphasis in our sentences is incredibly important because it's what the audience is going to pay attention to. And there, there are a couple of levels of this. And I want to start just by thinking about not dropping the end of your sentence. Um, so let's start. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of a sentence that, that I use in, in some of my talks. So uh, one of my concluding sentences. I want you to hear it a couple of different ways, and, and we'll see what you think. So first, dropping the end. So as we see here, climate change can simplify a food with. I mean, how does that make you kind of feel about, yeah. So now let's try it a second way. So as you can see here, we can see that climate change simplifies food webs. So that was holding on to the end of the sentence. 
And now yet another way to, to put it is, as we can see here, climate change simplifies food webs. So those are three different things. The first was dropping the end, the second was actually trying to pick up on that, and the third was not only picking up on the end, but directing it somewhere in the audience. So using what Annie was just showing us about directing your energy to someone somewhere in the audience and trying to make that connection. Um, so for those of you who brought sentences or anyone who wants to try this, I'd like you to all get up and let's try it. Let's take a sentence and I want you to first say it out loud and drop the end of your sentence. So everyone's got one? Mm -hmm. All right, let's start. Climate change simplifies. Um, yeah, let's. Actually, you know what? Let's go around in a circle. We'll just go around, and I think you'll all hear the difference. So, so we're all dropping it this time? Yeah, we're all dropping it. So we'll go around where we all drop it. We'll go and we'll do a round where we all pick up on the end of it. And then lastly, we'll all go around. We'll, we'll do a different thing the third time. We'll see what we do. All right, so first, everyone drop it. Gosh, i got to think of a sentence now. Um, uh, ice cream is delicious on birthday cake. change simplifies kelp forest food webs. Your gift is an investment in excellence. We are interested in studying quantum systems how to reduce the In my talk, I'd like to present our newest development. It's dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. <laughs> Vanilla ice cream is delicious on birthday cake. Great. Um, so I'm sure we, we can all hear a huge difference from that. Um, so 
But what I'd like to do is kind of take it to the next place, and that is by incorporating um, Annie's exercise of using a tennis ball or trying to picture yourself throwing that top, that last bit of your sentence at somebody in the audience. Um, you really want to make an impression with that. Uh, so we can actually all try this together. So much like, mm -hmm. again, get your imaginary ball, get ready, find someone in the room, and then I want you to launch that sentence at them. So climate change can simplify food webs. <laughs> All together? All together. Climate change. Vanilla ice cream is delicious with birthday cake. How'd that feel for everybody? Good? All yeah. Right, I'd like to try oh, one very, yeah. I have a question. So is the idea to do it with every sentence? Not with that. Um, I would say probably not with, well, first off, you don't want to drop so endings of sentences ball. all over the place. But throwing the ball, if you're making a major point, uh, or really trying to draw your audience. Yeah. Is that the next thing we do? Yeah, that is in, in fact going to be the next thing. Uh, yeah, the next thing we're going to be doing is talking about build and talking about how to build that intensity. This is really kind of your finishing touch where you want to finish off and make a point. You want to make a connection with your audience. Because when you're out there giving a talk, sure you have your slides, sure you have the board. But at the end of the day, it's about a conversation you are having with your audience, and you need to make that connection. May I, may I add to that? Yes. I, I think it really is a case-by-case -case thing, but I, I find that so often, whether we're talking about you know, acting or whether we're talking about delivering a talk, we drop the ends of the sentences routinely. It's a kind of a very habitual thing that we do. And so I would say it better to err in the direction that what you have to say is interesting and moving forward and in terms of the very launched energy of the ball toss, you would save those. But as a general rule of thumb, I would say your ends of sentences should be not dropped if you want to be effective. But if you don't want to be effective, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, should we do the catch? Put on catch. Sure, if you want. Uh, we can use the ball if you want. Or? Of course. California, and all I think there's a difference between an uplift and not dropping it. No, I, I think it's finding but the balance. It's true. It's, it's very true. true. Mm -hmm. Them, but we can try it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's actually, we want to go around one more time. Okay. And this time, instead of just not dropping the end of your sentence and being up on it, what I'd like you to, each person, find a specific person in the audience and direct that to them. And we'll go around one last time and try it that way. Okay. Yeah? So, um, we'll go there. So, climate change simplifies health forest food webs. Vanilla ice cream is delicious on birthday cake. When giving a talk, don't stand on one foot. <laughs> I'm trying to learn how to project the noise. Nice. <laughs> nice, nice. I'm afraid I can't remember my sentence. I hope you're fine in laughing to bring me at the expansion of my eye.
Yeah, I just want to add one little tweak here. For my money, sometimes you're giving a talk, and it's too terrifying to look people in the eye. But again, fake it till you make it. People can't tell if you're looking them in the eye, as long as you're in the ballpark. You look and look right here, just right the tops of their heads, and that's perfectly fine. See, right now, I'm looking at all of the tops of your heads, but you can still be sending that energy. I'm not actually looking at any of you in the eye. I'm just demonstrating that, you know, I can just... It's the intention of your energy moving all the way to your audience. Now, in terms of the build, um, I was going to do a kind of silly exercise. I don't know, it might be too silly for you guys. We're very serious people. But let's, let's give it a shot. So I play a game with... I have uh, six-year-old twins, two boys. And uh, we, we like to, you know, always stimulate their imaginations and their, their learning and all that. And sometimes we play a little game at the dinner table. It's a, it's a children's game that we're, now we're going to adapt um, for our purposes. We're, this, this part of the talk is about uh, laundry lists and building. Okay, so let's imagine that you have a list of things. If I say I went to the store and I bought some ice cream and some cake and some creme brulee and some apple crumble and some socks and some... It, it, yeah, exactly. Big yawn. Bores everybody. People don't know what's important in that list and it all kind of becomes the same. It all becomes kind of beige. So for, the, for our game, let's, um, instead of using, limiting it to things you might find at a grocery store, let's throw in some understandable, for those of us who are novices in the world of physics, uh, terminology. So I'll say, I'm studying uh, atoms. And now I'd like you to say, I'm studying atoms and something that begins with a B. And binary systems. And then I'd like you to say, I'm studying atoms, I'm studying binary systems, and I'm studying something with a C. You see? But I'd like, as you do it, let's pretend that as we proceed in the alphabet, these are all more and more important things and that they're all different from each other. Let's just see what happens, okay? So I'm studying atoms. Great. Now, do you hear how dissipation sounded really important? <laughs> the other three, uh, you know, atoms are kind of boring. But make the thing that you're adding in the most important. Let's go for that. Go ahead. Wow. Wow. I want to study with you. That's fascinating. Can I, can I give you the challenge as we continue? I think it might be a little hard to keep adding things. Yeah? Is it enough on our list? So let's, let's go through the list. Those of you who can remember it. I don't know that I will be able to. And can we see if we can make each thing different from each other? So now we've kind of created our laundry list, but right now it does seem kind of like a laundry list. Can we see what happens if... Um, each of these things are uniquely fascinating, which they are. Let's see what happens. All right. Really 
really nice job in making them different from each other. Did you hear that? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, great, great, great. Let's not add any more on because I think you guys have done a wonderful job. But now let's see what happens. Uh, we'll do a little experiment this time. If the final culminating most important part of your talk was the last word, which was what? Jupiter. Jupiter. All of this other stuff is fascinating. But the most fascinating thing is Jupiter. And in fact, each thing is incrementally more fascinating than the thing before it. So let's try this time. If, sorry, the, it's, on, it's all on you. If we can build with each thing, each thing is more interesting than the thing that preceded it. Can we try? <laughs> Give it a try. Wow. Okay. Okay. Let, let's let's stop adding any new ones on. Let's stop adding any new ones on. It's too it's too long of a list. So just do the first five. Just do the first five, and each one is more more important than the one before it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so we're interested in uh, atoms, um, borons, cars, dissipation, and electrons. Great, bless you. We start with atoms. Borons are, of course, examples of atoms <laughs> which make up cars. They all undergo dissipation, but everything in the end is made of electrons. <laughs> Some of us were more successful than others. That's okay. That's, that's equally important for you to learn as you're listening to your colleagues when it's effective and when it's not. Now, for my money, it's less effective when they're all in the same pitch and volume. They're all equalized. So let me give you an example. And I probably get these wrong. We're studying atoms, borons, cars, dissipation, electrons. Kind of boring. None of them pop out. We're studying atoms, borons, cards, 
electrons, oh, dissipation, and electrons. We're, let me try that again. We're, ch we're studying atoms, borons, cars, dissipation, electrons. So they went up in pitch, slightly in volume and enthusiasm. So pitch is your friend. Now another example I want to use of um, adjusting your pitch to make yourself followed and understood has to do with parenthetical phrases. So I just made something up, which was, let's see. The sun, which sustains all life on Earth, is pretty darn hot. Okay, do you see there's a parenthetical phrase in there, which sustains all life on Earth? One of the biggest things I do as an actor, you know, when I'm scoring my text, which is something I'm guessing you all might do with your talks, every time I come across a parenthetical phrase, I will put very large parentheses around it. This is something I really recommend you do. I recommend you find your laundry lists and you score those with a light line under a word, two light, two light lines on the next word, dark line under the next, when, you're, when you have lists. Now in parentheticals, I suggest you put brackets around your parent parentheses and you either elevate the parenthetical phrase or you drop the parenthetical phrase so that it's in a different pitch. Let me give you some examples. Here's it all the same. The sun, which sustains all life on earth, is pretty darn hot. That's all the same. Now here's me elevating the parenthetical phrase. The sun, which sustains all life on earth, is pretty darn hot. Now here's me elevating the rest of it and dropping the parenthetical. The sun, which sustains all life on earth, is pretty darn hot. So you have lots of options within that, but I would suggest to you that taking your parentheses, putting them out there on your paper as you're going through, and making a choice about whether you want to raise or drop those is very helpful. Yeah. Well, certainly we improvise a lot in, in acting as well. I would say, as I'm improvising with you right now, and I know that if I'm improvising, I can raise my pitch to make a point. Do you see how I just did that with that little phrase? Um, why don't we all try it? Why don't we, you can either use my phrase or you can come up with your own, perhaps from your talk, where I'm going to say, um, uh, when giving talks, which I often do, I need to make myself clear. Do you see how I raised that parenthetical phrase? We want to try one? Well, well, as I'm saying, you could raise it or you could drop it. But the, the important thing is breaking up the sentence so that everything is not in the same place. Does that make sense? So I could say, um, when I give talks, which I often do, I need to make myself clear. Sure. And let, let's, we can try dropping it. When I give talks, which I often do, I need to make myself clear. Does that make sense? You're like helping people hear it. Please. You're, exactly, thank you. So it's kind of like the not dropping the end. It's like you're teaching the audience what you're saying. Well, it's, it's um, differentiating pitch within your talk so that they know what's important and what's not important. Would it actually uh, help to, uh, to redirect your throw as a dissertation uh, to the next point where you want to go? Sure. It absolutely can. I can, I can see you doing that very naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I often find uh, when I give talks that uh, parentheticals are nice places to have asides to your audience. So you're delivering brilliant but dry material and parentheticals and, and places like that and changes in emphasis and direction are all places where you can insert a little bit of your yourself, really, and make your talk a bit more human. 
um, which, going back to what Lila was talking about in the previous lecture, really, again, brings you back as the, the hero of your story. It's like you have a transition. Yeah. So the next thing you want to talk about, um, Hello. Um, the next thing we wanted to talk about is on the next page. Um, has to do with passion in your talk. And this is something I touched on last time for those of you who saw my talk a couple weeks ago. But um, we thought it was useful to bring up here too because a lot of the energy we're talking about communicating is connected to your passion, right? Like this isn't artificial energy you're generating so that people will watch. It's actually because you care about this stuff. And something I found from watching talks here and at NCs and other places is that what you guys do is such old news to you guys, right? Like you've spent all day working on this stuff, you went to grad school, you did a postdoc, you're a professor, like wherever you are in it, you're really steeped in this stuff. But for most people you're talking to, it's brand new information. And I think that's a really useful thing to think about. Isn't, it, is, it isn't so useful to think about, like, how do I feel about this information today? Because you're nervous, you're worried your talk isn't good enough, it's, don't, don't, don't go there. <laughs> but if it's like, who are these people in the audience that have never heard of this? And remember how excited I was the first time I learned about this. It's going back to kind of a childlike wonder and discovery and letting that kind of infuse what's behind your sentences. So even if it's old news for you, thinking about it as new news for them helps you kind of lean forward and helps you want to share it as compared to like, oh, I have to talk about this thing again. I'd much rather, you know, like, you know, and, and obviously, like you guys talk about this, the same talk again and again, it gets old, but actors have to do the same play every night, right? And they have to make it feel new. I mean, sometimes actors have to do the same play twice in a day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for actors- For years. <laughs> Annie has some stories about that, but that's a different talk. Um, so we were going to just talk about passion and how to get some passion behind what you're saying. And Annie has a really fun exercise that I'm hoping she'll share. Well, um, something that we sometimes do with our actors is we have them add a little phrase at the end of each line. And, and we could try adding the phrase, get this, at the end of your line. It's better than the other one. Maybe. I think you do the other one. Well, you can... You can we can. I don't know. Let's start, with get this. Let's, let's start with get this. So do you guys have, say, two or three sentences you can whip out or improvise? So I might say, for example, um, vanilla ice cream is delicious on birthday cake. Get this. It's fat free. And what happens when you eat it, get this, you feel really good. So each thing that I'm adding, the little get this at the end, is conveying that what I have to say is crucial for you to hear, and there's more to come that's even more important. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. you want to try something? Sure. So get this. When you give a talk, you really don't want to stand on one foot, because get this, it makes you seem off balance. No, it's no, okay. It's so, can you, can you go yeah. around there? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
self driving. I decided to send get this like an offspring because get this they told me I look more powerful. <laughs> really nice. I actually noticed a big difference there. What you were doing. It's great. <laughs> Do this into the mic. So big waves come through and remove kelp. Now get this. That means that all of the animals go away. And can you fucking believe this? The whole food web collapses. So that's a variation that I find helps me uh, actually quite a bit really hit those points of emphasis. Yeah. Uh, well, we were just, I was thinking before I was going to use the can you fucking believe this, but it seemed like maybe my, my potty mouth didn't go over so well before, so I wasn't sure how people feel about that. <laughs> but that's really what I would have my students say. Well, and the idea that like the can you fucking believe this isn't something you'd ever say in the middle of your talk, but that it's running through your head and it's the energy you're sending out. I know it makes you a little more vulnerable, but it actually makes the audience much more likely to listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of Obama's great successes in the campaign was that urgency and that, like, can you believe this? Can you believe this is how our, you know? And, and I think the fact that he broke that rule of seeming calm and actually, now he's seeming calm a lot, that's also another conversation. <laughs> but I, I think it was attractive to people because they could feel something alive in it. They could feel some juice. They were mm -hmm. like, oh, I feel frustrated and he's talking. And mm -hmm. so I don't know. I think if, it might be fun if you're running through your talk to throw in some get this or can you fucking believe this. It also makes you loosen up and have a little mm -hmm. more fun, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. such an absurd thing to say. Yeah. What? You want to try it or, like, including some? I don't know. Does the room feel up to trying? Can you fucking believe this? Yes? No? I hear a no over here. I think, I think we'll let them ruminate on it. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to move into the last part of our talk now. And, Jarrett, why don't you explain? These are the focus tools I was talking about at the beginning. Sure. So a lot of what we've been talking about um, is really fantastic for warming up. But I know one of the things that um, a lot of scientists have said to me when we've talked about speaking is, what can I do right before a talk so I don't feel incredibly nervous and like I'm going to lose it? Um, Annie's exercises on, on really visualizing a tree or visualizing some something that's strong and really puts you in your body um, is absolutely key. But there are a couple of other little things that can help you, both with um, the talk you're about to give to loosen up your, your face, your mouth, your voice, and limber you up, and, and I think also put you in a pretty good headspace. Um, so I was going to give you three things that I do before a talk. And, and I do these, uh, if I can get the room alone, I try and do this uh, out loud so I can work on my voice. But sometimes at conferences, I'll even go out to the back of the room before I have to get up there and do these. And I find it improves my diction. Uh, so I'm much more clearly understood and just loosens me up and makes me really uh, get into where I am. So these are three different tongue twisters. To have good diction, tongue twisters are quite useful. Um, and I'd like us to try all of these. So we're going to start with um, what are the three I wanted to do. Right. So we'll start with my, I think, my favorite, which is 11 benevolent elephants. So everybody, and, and over-enunciate as much as you can. Eleven, Eleven benevolent, benevolent elephants. elephants. Jared, what does enunciating do? What enunciating does is that it uh, sharpens your voice. It, it really makes your words stand out individually. So I could be talking to you like this, or I could be talking to you like this, where even if I'm using the same kind of force and energy, although you'll notice that immediately it, it drops down a little bit because it's hard not to when you're really not enunciating. But when you're actually using good diction and, and hitting consonants well, um, you'll, you'll make a, a stronger impression uh, and really, I find, give a, a better talk. These tongue twisters are, are useful for that. They're also, uh, you're not going to be thinking about your diction when you're up in, in front of a, a huge auditorium of people, typically. Um, but this is a way of getting your mouth, getting your face, getting your muscles to relax and start doing it. So let's try it again. Let's try the 11 benevolent elephants three times. So 11, 11 benevolent, benevolent elephants. elephants, 11 benevolent elephants, 11 benevolent elephants. Right, that's, that's good. Um, one way to get it going even further is let's, let's all try taking, take your finger and we're going to put it in our mouths and do it again three times 11 benevolent elephants, so like this. 
Eleven benevolent elephants. Eleven benevolent elephants. Eleven benevolent elephants. Now do it normally. Eleven benevolent elephants. Eleven benevolent elephants. Well, the benevolent elephants. Do you see how even after doing that, you're you're starting to relax into it. It's actually easier to start to use your your voice and use your mouth and use your diction that way. So I'm going to try two others just so you have these in your quiver before you uh, go up and give a talk. Um, the next one that that I like to do is unique New York. So three times. Unique New York. Unique New York. Unique New York. Another good one. And the last one, which is uh, another one I really enjoy uh, red leather, yellow leather. Red, red leather, 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 yellow leather. leather. Red, red leather, leather, yellow leather. Red, red leather, leather, yellow leather. And as you do these, you can feel they're hitting different parts of your mouth. They're working on different consonants that you're going to have to use, hard ones, soft ones. Um, and, and I find they're just generally really helpful. If there, there's one thing I do before I go up and give a talk, it's, it's work through those three or other similar tongue twisters. Great. Another thing you can do, and obviously these seem sort of silly and out of context right now, but in those you know, three minutes before you go up and you're super nervous, it's really good to have something constructive to do that's going to help you give a better presentation. I know before I have to get up and talk or teach, all the worst case scenario, what if I forget what I was going to say? What if I didn't really program that slide? You know, all, of, all the kind of, ah, I just want to run away stuff comes and gets you. But if you can have these more constructive rituals, whether it's thinking about the oak tree, just practicing your diction to make sure you're going to be really clear when you get up there, something I like to do, and this is an easier one to do if you're in a big room and you can't kind of sneak away, is just stand really still. Or sit, even, if you have to be sitting. Or sit. You can do this one sitting, too. And I call this a body scan. And I always imagine, and this is what my high school theater teacher said to do, but it's like a neon blue circle is around your feet. And it just sort of slowly rises up around your body. And you just kind of pay attention to each place it is and see if you're tight anywhere. Like, I know I get tight before something in my shoulders, right? So when the blue circle gets up to my shoulders, I could take a second and just kind of rub this and be like, hey, it's going to be OK. It's a way to kind of check in and see where you're holding your tension. Because all of us, when we get up there, it can be really clear if you're tense. I mean, Jarrett was teaching a workshop in Sweden last year. And I watched all of these talks. And it was about structural equation modeling. And I'm a playwright. So I had no idea <laughs> what was going on in the talk. So instead, I watched the talks for people's performance and kind of the story people were telling with their performance. And what I noticed is that a lot of women end up on one foot and like this when they're talking if they're nervous. They end up kind of hidden behind the podium, like, let me just disappear. Mm -hmm. And so it's really good to pay attention when you're talking to be like, oh my god, why am I like clutching myself? And put your hand down. And a lot of the men kind of just got a little like, the more they talked, they kind of disappeared into them, you know. And it's little things like that that send a sign to your audience. It's like, oh, she's nervous. Or, oh, he doesn't really believe what he's saying. You know, they, they kind of end up telling a different story with your body than what you're saying with your mouth. And you really want them to listen to the mouth story, right? So if I'm standing here like this telling you guys this, you're going to be like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Whereas if I'm like, don't you know, hold yourself when you talk, you're more likely to hear what I'm saying. So a fun exercise might be to do a practice talk and really pay attention to your body instead of what you're saying. Because at this point, you guys know a lot of these talks well. Obviously, when you're up there, you want to be paying attention to a little bit of everything. Another thing to do, and I hate doing this, but it's really good to do, is to video yourself giving a talk and then watch it, because you learn so much about what your habits are. Like when I first started teaching, I used to say, all right, all the time. It was like my word for when I didn't know what I was saying. And I had somebody observe me teach, and she was like, you must have said all right like 50 times <laughs> in the first 10 minutes of class. And I was like, wow, that for me is kind of a nervous thing I do. And we all have them. I mean, it's, it's not a, a problem that you have them. It's just good to isolate them, and if you can, just slowly drop them out of your vocabulary. And something that's good to fill in instead is like, instead of saying, all right, I'm going to focus on keeping both feet on the ground. I'm going to be an oak tree while I talk. I'm not going to be a one-footed tree. Um, so the body scan, going back to what I was saying before, is a really good way to kind of just give yourself a chance to check in with your body and what's going on and kind of just pay attention to anywhere that's tight and stretch it out a little bit. Another thing that's really good to do is just stand or sit if you need to and take three really deep breaths. 
often before we are doing something we're nervous about, we get really, you get really nervous, you get really in here, you know, we get really tight here, and I think there's something about like feeling your feet on the ground. Okay, I'm gonna give this talk now. Instead of like, where's my slide, where's my, you know, that's because you can be in either starting place and it really, like, where you launch from, I think, really affects the beginning of your talk. And something I talked about in my last talk is that you really only have a couple minutes to hook an audience. Like, people will give you maybe, I don't know, five minutes tops to catch them. And then after that, it's much harder to get them back. So you want to start strong, you want to start confident, you want to really have the top of your talk down so you can look out at them and not kind of be depending on the slides to know what you're going to say next. Um, so the tools I'm offering you here, I guess, are the breathing, the body scan, and Jarrett's tongue twisters, which I think we've any more. Um, yeah. And what you said about, I think is really important about what you have to say is interesting to them and they've never heard it before. Right. So that's again sort of the fake it till you make it. If you can pretend for the 10 minutes of your talk or five minutes of your talk or 20 minutes of your talk, that actually you are a fabulous <laughs> elocutionist as well as scientist, and you just play that role for a few minutes. That can help a lot. Well, and we've been talking a lot about the imagination today and kind of thinking of yourself as a tree or thinking of yourself as throwing a ball. And while it sounds silly, it actually gives you a, a power and a strength on stage because you're using a different part of yourself than other people who are talking are. Obviously, you're not going to get up there and throw the ball at somebody while you're talking, you know, but having that in you makes you a more interesting speaker. Do you want to explain about the visualization? Uh, sure. sure. Um, one of the last things you can do before you launch into your talk, and something that I found very helpful, is a visualization. So you're up there, you've done your, your prep before the talk, you've done your tongue twisters, you've sat there, you've centered yourself, you've breathed, and now you're about to launch, you're about to get into that talk, and you have a second before you go and begin. And one thing I find very helpful is to think about, who am I, who am I giving this talk? I'm this passionate person, I'm going to make them interested, but who, who am I? And we've all seen different people give fabulous talk. We all have professors or speakers uh, who we really admire, whose science we admire, whose style we admire. And we all know what we have of that inside of ourselves. So one thing I like to do is visualize, like, who is, who is somebody that I want to be when I give this talk? Um, is it Superman? Is it um, my advisor, Times? Uh, who, who is it? Is it Obama, again, great, great uh, orator. Who is it going to be? Um, so what we, one thing we talk about doing is by wrapping up, um, by each of us giving the, the few sentences or paragraphs that we, we brought in here. Um, but before you do that, what we'd like you to do is take a minute, put yourself together, and think about who is this person that I want to be when I'm giving this talk, and then give it. Yeah, use any and all of the tools of today. Do you want to go around and try that? Should I start? OK. So this is going to be just the, the introduction of a, a talk that I'm giving on Monday. Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking to you about kelp forests, about food webs, and along the way, what I'd like to do is give you an introduction to who I am as a scientist and the strengths that I am going to bring to your institution. Okay. That was nice. Yeah, moving on. Really nice. I, 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 don't, I mean, I've been talking all day. Yeah. I don't think you guys need to hear me anymore because I don't have a talk. <laughs> Nice. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right. I like how you adjusted your body before you start, and you took a moment. Yeah. You took a moment. resonated for me today was Annie talking about really differentiating something when you're making a list, like really thinking about the different importance and the different ways all these things on a list can sound when you're talking about them. Cool. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah. said. I mean, I guess for me, uh, it was surprising how much difference it makes whether or not you drop the pattern at the end. Um, it, I guess it also makes a difference whether you talk to the floor in front of you, which I tend to do very often, um, or whether you talk to people. So I'll try to work on that. Good. If you have nothing, maybe you have a, one of these mics. Well, you'll notice that as, as I'm talking, I'll tend to do this, and I'll somewhat use my arms to gesticulate. Um, I, I've been doing this for so long that I don't think about it. I mean, sometimes my arms are this. If I'm very uh, aware of my arms, I might just do this. And then you can still take them apart as need be. I would say um, try that, or this is a, is a good um, part of that. I, I, what do you do? What do you do, Joe? Um, you know, if you're on the stage and there's someone introducing the yeah, speaker, yeah, yeah, it's going yeah. to be a very long lifting of the slides. Um, I would, I mean. Oh, before you're talking, you mean? Yeah, say you're just standing there. And mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't oh, understand. Actually, usually I, I hold my hands together. And mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is fine, too, if you're yeah, waiting. This feels awkward, but it's okay, too. Mm -hmm. This is fine. Yeah, I think yeah, this is not so good. This is like, go away. <laughs> yeah, I would say this is your least good choice. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. If you're an actor. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll just stand and, I mean, I'm a big fan actually of putting my hands mm -hmm. in my pocket. And I don't do this because this always looks kind of defensive. But just putting mm -hmm. thumbs in and putting their hands in. Mm -hmm. ready. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, thank you. Working outside of your comfort zone. Yeah.
Hahaha, very sweet.